Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 597. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and today is May 15th, 2020. All right, today's going to be more casual. We're in the middle of a hysteric pandemic, and George and I don't want to add to any of that, but we certainly want to keep you grounded with uh, as much factual news as we can and let you know what's going on around the world with the pandemic and how the church is responding to it and some of the new. But before we get to the new, and there's a lot of new, let's talk about your responsibility as a faithful viewer here at Anglican Unscripted, and that is to like. You click that little thumbs up either on YouTube or Facebook. Share. You really, okay, you guys, you're you're dropping the ball on sharing. You should be sending this to everybody you know, even relatives, even the crazy Uncle Bob. You should watch us. Uh, You guys are the most faithful commenters. I love to see the discussions that are going on in the comments. Uh, Right after I publish the show, I, you know, within minutes, oh, I'm first here. That's cool. I'm, I'm glad you guys are like that. That's, that's kind of a neat thing about our audience that you like to comment. If you had not subscribed yet, and uh, I'm looking at the, the ratings, you know, nearly 70 to 75% of you have already subscribed. That's perfect. Yeah, that's a good number. But if you really want to know when the next episode's coming right out, click that little subscribe rectangle. It's red. A bell's going to pop up, and the bell is going to say, click here, and then you'll get instant notifications that we have a new show. Also, we know we're not good looking. It's, it's fine. It there's no pretense here. We're, we're over 45 and, you know, I, I have trouble with the, the razor on top. And George, look, did you finally get a haircut? Finally got a haircut. The barbershops are open. Oh, cool. If you don't want to sit and look at us, you can listen to us on a podcast. You'll find those on the show notes in YouTube on our channel. <sighs> All right. I got I that mean, out of the way. Is what, this is what $8 gets you in uh, Zoom <laughs> Really? Because I still got stubble. I need to, you know, to work on it some more. But uh, I've not gone to a barber in probably two or three years. I just use my beard trimmer, and it just goes wild on top. George, the new. Um, we've talked and hinted about what's you know happening and uh, what will never return to normal in this pandemic. And I've been watching more and more people like my wife who are the essential employees but no longer have to go to, back to work. Work said you can work from home indefinitely. Now, I've worked from home for about 12 years, and I have my home office, which is going to be slowly invaded by my wife pretty soon as we set up a, a desk for her up here. But this, there's a new paradigm where people are as productive at home as they are at the office. And I'm watching Barclays, Bank of America, all these big New York firms say, we don't need people coming into the office anymore. We can't justify paying $71 a square foot for rental space in at the corner of Wall and Main when they're doing just fine working at home. And that's kind of be the, the new dynamic as far as real estate goes. And it's going to be hard to watch a place like New York City, which has relied highly on its uh, uh, high rents, fold and have uh, real estate problems, George. Yeah, you know, we've, we've seen these things in the past. In the uh, 70s, there began the flight uh, out to the suburbs. Like IBM moved to Armonk, New York, uh, way out in, uh, I think that's Westchester yeah, County. Yeah, way out there, yeah. Um, and then, so we had a downturn in Manhattan real estate. Well, then it came back, and that's when people like Donald Trump made their money uh, as business entrepreneurs. But I think we're seeing, uh, but you're talking about a different phenomena of... Uh, cities not uh, having the same function that they once did as being necessary centers of commerce. When I was very young man, my first job out of college was as a clerk on the commodities exchange. I was one of these young men uh, who uh, ran between the trading pit to the brokers on the phones, uh, but, and I, we were number four, sure. yeah. number four world, world Trade Center. And, if you remember the old intro from uh, Wall Street Week with Louis P. Rukeyser of the guys on the phones with the long extension cords yelling and shouting and making gestures, that's what I did when I was 20 years old. Uh, I wasn't a broker, I was a runner. Yeah. That 
the stock the stock exchange the floor of the stock exchange market making it's all basically become unnecessary because it's now the NSDAC for instance is uh, displacing the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange you remember that oh well, yeah well, um, it's gone <laughs> what we're uh, what we're seeing though is another uh, iteration in uh, the commercial culture of the United States with city I can be and you and I are examples. We live in smallish town. I mm -hmm. live in a very small town. I live yeah. actually in a village. You live in uh, a village. I live in a, 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 a fledgling township called Milford. Yes, and we are able to have the same degree of access the, uh, to the international church news, church world, as if we lived in New York or London or mm -hmm. or Los Angeles. And there's no need. Uh, at this stage, the only need I have to go into my church office is to get away from my wife, but also <laughs> to do pastoral counseling, to have uh, to have the privacy of being able to speak to people one on one, and then of course you like to have a secretary with the window in the door to make sure that nobody can claim you're doing bad things. Yeah. Um, no, but and the whole function of the business space, it, I think, this is it was on this trajectory. But I think you're right, Kevin, that coronavirus has basically sped this up very, very quickly. Well, I remember two years ago, Amazon was going to move to Brooklyn. And uh, the big uh, selling point was they're bringing a tax base. They're bringing a built-in tax base. All these employees are going to making uh, 125000 or more, and that's going to br bring money to the city coffers. Well, if Amazon moved there now, Amazon employees, the corporate ones, can work from anywhere. So they're not bringing a full amount of this tax base with them. So if I work for IBM or Amazon or any of the big companies, my uh, tax money is where I work, uh, my state. So I pay a state income tax, unless I move to Florida, where there is no state income tax. Well, my daughter has just moved, for, is in the process of moving from Los Angeles to the East Bay, San Francisco area. and. She's newly out of college. She works as a nurse at an eating disorder clinic, and she's gotten a promotion and is now working at the clinic up in the, it's in Lafayette, California, which is what next to Walnut Creek. And there, it's yeah. the very yeah. nice uh, area just above Silicon Valley. Well, she's looking for places to live. Single uh, one bedroom apartments, $2,500. Um, and what, and if she drives a little farther south into San Mateo and to uh, Mountain View, that's, you know, people are driving to where she is because yeah. they can't afford to live in the Google land in Silicon yeah. Valley. And what we're seeing in California, and we most recently saw this with Elon Musk and Tesla, that the cost of living, uh, the cost of taxation is, is basically saying, why do I need to be in Silicon Valley? I can move to Austin, Texas. I can move to Nevada. I can move to Florida, Orlando, and my employ and get the same amount of labor out of my employees at a fraction of the fixed costs of land and in California. Uh, sure, yeah, government taxation, and it's also going to come and hit in the church because our typical church operation is run uh, as an old-fashioned company. Of you need all these people cramped in a bit in one building doing all these services and what we're finding in our personal experience is the bookkeepers doing a great job working from home the receptionists doing a great job working from home doing the phones and the various communications aspects at the end of the day we only need our building for worship and for pastoral counseling and distribution of food for the homeless things like that for services and service industries but not for administration and management what is this going to look like in the future? How is the church going to function in the future? Does the bishop need a standalone office uh, to do his work? Or in the future, can a bishop's office be basically on his laptop and his secretary's laptop? And what's the hope of church planting in the future? Our church is just going to be uh, out there planting virtual parishes. And if it's a virtual parish, do we have to have people all from the same town? Or can we set up a virtual parish citywide or statewide or international virtual parish? You know, it, this, there's a new paradigm shift being offered by this pandemic that was unforeseen in any way, shape, or form 
five years ago, ten years ago, and this is the new. Well, this also goes back to Anglican history and one of the failures of Anglicanism in the United States during the Great Westward Expansion. As people moved west, uh, churches moved west. The problem was, for the, Angl for the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church, you could only have a priest do it, and you had to do it according to the Book of Common Prayer. And so when you had lay Methodist circuit riders, and basically when you clericalized your religion, when you had expansion like that, you took a major hit. So we're seeing a, a form of the westward expansion. We're seeing people moving out of the old sort of paradigms of how they worship and work and congregate into new areas. Um, will family worship now take a bigger role in the life or will it always be father of uh, sort of father knows best and centered around the priest at the altar? Sure. So that in other words, these it's not, I think the one, the one thing that we can say is that it's not going to go back to the way it was. What it's going to look like in the future, I don't know, and it's part of the experiments. See, for Anglicanism, you cannot have a, a real valid Eucharist uh, over the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, the prayer book says, you know, the priest must touch the bread and wine to consecrate it. And you can't touch. You can't stick your hand out and touch every. You know, Pat Robertson can do this. He can stick his hand out and touch yeah. you. Kenneth Copeland, yeah. Uh, but I can't do that. No. So that. But then, what about these churches? These sort of new liturgical churches that uh, ape uh, sort of the Anglican way of doing things, but don't have the structures and traditions. Are they going to basically grab market share? <laughs> well. I look at it from the perspective like Anglican TV. Anglican TV uh, came to fame and was a wonderful ministry because we were unique. We had a camera that hooked up to the internet and I could travel anywhere in the world, uh, whether it be Mabara, Uganda, whether it be uh, um, Africa, whether it be uh, Egypt, and plug in an event live to the internet. That was cool. Kevin, you're doing a wonderful job. And now they realize how simple it was. But it was unique. Now I'm not unique. There's nothing unique about Anglican TV and the ministry we provide. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the old Anglican TV. We have to rethink how we're going to do Anglican TV from now on because every church now has a camera where they can record special events and they rec record the worship and all that. I don't have to go around to conferences anymore because people have learned the dynamic of taking a camera and a computer and putting their worship and sessions online. All done. And, and But the flip <laughs> side is Anglican TV and Anglican Inc. actually has a, a more important role because when the only, vi the only video you get is that from the organizer. Yeah. If, the, if basically you're only seeing the good stuff, the highlights, you don't 90% of my productive work at these conferences has been talking to people behind the scenes, not sitting through the plenaries, but talking to people at dinner, at breaks, what's going on, how do you see this happening, and this and that. And part of the, uh, well, one of the, uh, one of the great successes of Ronald Reagan, people would say, was that he went around the media uh, and talked to people directly over the television. And it's the same thing with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has, through Twitter, whether you love him or hate him, has created a new channel of communication between his office and the people. And the old sort of gatekeepers, the media, the, the networks, uh, Kevin and George, are finding that they have a new role, but it's a, that's not the same as their old one. And so this all, and, but again, this coronavirus is just speeding up these transformations. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's shake and bake. You put a whole bunch of stuff in a bag, you shake it, you throw it in the oven, you see how it comes out because uh, everything's going to be completely different. Uh, one of the big concerns I see from priests, Kevin, I got 500 people watching me on a Sunday. Is this real? Or do I really have 500 people watching me on a Sunday or watching throughout the week? I mean, are these numbers we're seeing real? 
And I don't have an answer for that because there is no Nielsen rating for YouTube. There's no Nielsen rating for Facebook. We know that there's bots out there for uh, countries and uh, Google to uh, add search bots so they know, know what's out there. But uh, as far as we can tell, I would guarantee 65 to 70 percent of those numbers are real. And if you go to the analysis on YouTube and Facebook, it'll show you where people tuned in and where they tuned out during the live service. Um, but we don't know what's real anymore as far as who's watching. It's one of those interesting things. Now somebody has to go set up a Nielsen rating for YouTube. There's, a, there's an industry there for somebody. <laughs> well, there is opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I do a midweek service and a Sunday service. Midweek service traditionally had a dozen people in in person. Mm -hmm. Now I've got ten times, twenty times of that supposedly watching it, according to all the metrics that I'm getting. Uh, I don't have that ratio on Sunday. We our average was two twenty five. I'm not getting two thousand. Yeah. Um, but I know I'm getting people from far away. But here's the thing: are they there for three seconds? Oh, George is doing something. Oh, God, not another service. And they <laughs> click off. Uh, but does that count as a view, uh, whereas my wife starts early and leaves late uh, in the viewership? We don't know that. And with, so trying to sort of plan, uh, we don't have accurate measurement tools as to what is really working out there. Okay. All right. That's enough pandemic news. Well, actually, the next story is pandemic as well. Um, <laughs> And it's a hard one because somebody got caught doing what I support him doing. Uh, he, he showed up as a, a secret chaplain in a hospital. This is Justin Welby. But he did that after telling everybody, you can't do that. Uh, Kevin, what are you talking about? George, what am I talking about? Well, on May 12th, the Telegraph had an article about Justin Welby volunteering as a chaplain at St. Thomas's Hospital in London and that he would visit patients and provide pastoral care and support. Now, let me sort of step back because I'm going to offer commentary about that um, rather, and rather than the actual actions themselves. Justin Welby has a history of good intentions and bad execution. This is different from Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, who had bad intentions and excellent uh, execution. execution. Jeez. <laughs> she Indeed, opposite. Good she was good at achieving it. <laughs> Justin Welby's leadership of the Church of England wanted to set an example for the rest of England, and so they shut down the churches, including to their own clergy, which was a step far beyond the government's ask and was not well thought through and has led to all these charges that the Church of England has abandoned the public square, it's become privatized, it's just been a fiasco. Justin Welby set out rules that uh, early on, clergy were offering to volunteer at hospitals to meet the crisis. And the Church of England said no. Then they relented a bit and said, you may be a volunteer if you're under 60 and in good health, if there's nobody at your home who is vulnerable, and if the hospital provides the PPE, personal protection equipment that you need to do your job properly. Justin Welby, 64 years old. Uh -oh. According to his own rules, he should not be doing this at St. Thomas's Hospital. Now, never mind that he's never actually been a hospital chaplain. And there is a- oh, That's a whole those, new dynamic. That's a, you know, yeah. there's a dynamic there of training and experience yeah. and but you know, let's put that to one side. The, the, his intentions of reaching out to people, the Telegraph article said that he finds a great deal of solace in doing this. And that's true, I find that as well. But the execution of, of one rule for you and one rule for me is just a, another addition to his missteps that just so hold him up to ridicule and to not being taken as a serious weighty figure. Well, his, his desire was laudable, you know, and one of the biggest things we're going to look back on is all these people who had to die alone. Uh, here in New York and in the Northeast, chaplains aren't allowed in there. Uh, families are not, not allowed in the RCU when a patient is dying from uh, coronavirus. Uh, and 
So we have 90,000 people here in the Northeast who suffered and died. Well, I guess it's 90,000 in the, in the whole America, 60,000 here in the, in the Northeast who died alone. Yeah, we only have about, I think, 3,000 deaths in Florida. Yeah. I mean, again, it goes down to the state. The inner Mussolini of some governors has been on display here. In Florida, uh, a priest could go into a nursing home or a hospital when the person, wa person was an extremist. So you couldn't just do your regular pastoral rounds, and you couldn't do them because they were sick. But if they were about at the point of death, you could go in and give them last rites. Mm -hmm. The governor of Florida permitted that. And I know another of, a number of other states, Texas, and, some other, and, and a great swath of the Midwest, never had these degrees of uh, restrictions that Michigan and Pennsylvania and New York, New Jersey, and uh, Illinois had. So it's funny, those states that had the severest infections had the most uh, stringent uh, blocks to uh, pastoral and, uh, and uh, sacramental support. Yeah, I mean, it's sad. So laudable that uh, Justin Welby wanted to minister as a chaplain. Horrid that he wouldn't let other people do it. It's a, it's, it's a question of it's a question not of his moral morality. Yeah. I mean, his his instincts were good. What he did was good and praiseworthy and laudable. Yeah. Yeah. It was his leadership, and it yeah. comes down to a leader does not say one rule for me and one rule for thee. Yeah. It's the rules need to be enforced evenly. Wouldn't it be cool if the Telegraph reported about the hundreds of chaplains across uh, uh, England who are serving at the hospitals instead of one low uh, undercover Archbishop of Canterbury? Well, that yeah. would entail the Church of England press office uh, secretly <laughs> telling the Telegraph, uh, right. oh, cool. here's a secret that you can have the exclusive news story about. <sighs> oh, man, I'm becoming so cynical at my young age. All right, so here in America, we have leaders who are taking advantage of this pandemic, uh, government leaders. And I, I, my perfect example is the governor of Michigan, who has become a, a tyrant, a totalitarian, um, Mussolini in female flesh. And it's, it's wonderful as uh, an American historian and uh, world historian that I am to watch this and say, We've done this before. Just look at her. She's she's seething with the power. She loves this. And uh, last night or the uh, the day before, she took away the license of a barber to cut hair, just because he tried to open his his uh, salon uh, because he had no income. As a self-employed person, he didn't qualify for unemployment insurance and stuff like that. I know I'm self-employed, and so he had nothing. And at the yeah, the, her final victory in this. Well, I've just take away your license. Now you can't be licensed to cut hair. Why do we have licenses to cut hair? More totalitarianism, George. I think people you know, like me notice this. Do people in the church notice this? That there's more and more power grab uh, of the freedoms we've acquired over the last uh, two hundred years. Yes, on May 7th, Archbishop Vigano, and you may remember the name, he was the former papal nuncio in, in oh my, the former... Oh, wait, who, has a home, who has a home line? <laughs> <laughs> Pastors oh. have home lines. <laughs> AT&T is telling me I have a phone call. <laughs> oh, boy. Hopefully my wife will pick that up and not have anything in the background. <laughs> oh, well, goodness. Well, no, we, we will cut this part out. And back to the news. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, would you get the phone? How long does it go? All right. Please do go uh -huh. so, can you redo that in? Sure. Yeah. So let's transition to another story. Um, it's my love is history. I like to read history books and. I have studied world history and American history and European history, and one of the nobody ever lets a good pandemic or war go without finding out how they can become more powerful. And 
In this pandemic, I'm watching some state leaders and government leaders uh, here in America and around the world demonstrate what I would say is not democratic thought, freedom thought. And the state is saying, listen, we're here to protect you from you. We're here to make sure that you don't go out and harm other people. And we can do that by restricting your freedoms uh, and by taking away some guaranteed constitutional privileges just temporarily so that we can save more and more people. And I use as an example the governor of Michigan, who in this last six weeks has come out as, you know, a... <sighs> I don't want to be nasty in my words. A person with totalitarianism leanings. <laughs> uh, Mussolini in female flesh. I don't know how else to say this. Uh, and so yesterday, I'm watching the news, and this old 77-year-old guy who owns a barber shop, who doesn't get self, who does not get unemployment insurance because he's self-employed, uh, has no, had no income for six weeks, turns the lights on in a shop and invites some of his regular customers in to cut his hair. And she pulls his license and shuts him down and says, you know, no suit for you, basically. And I'm like, I hope the church is paying attention to this, George. I hope it's not just me seeing that sometimes the pandemic brings out the best of the church and the best in people, but sometimes th crisis and pandemics bring out the very worst in people, especially in leadership, George. Is the church paying attention? Some in the church are paying attention. On May 7th, uh, Archbishop Vigano, many of you will know his name. He was the one who was the former papal nuncio in Washington who released all the information about Cardinal McCarrick being a pervert and has been sort of in a quiet Cold War with uh, Pope Francis over the uh, abuse uh, culture within the Catholic Church. Archbishop Vigano uh, released authored a letter along with a number of other Catholic bishops and now three cardinals have signed on and a number of clergy and lawyers and it's, oh, and it's written to Catholics and people of goodwill of all faiths. So this is an open letter and was published on May 7th. And this letter basically, and some of the authors are Cardinal Zen of Hong Kong, a Baltic cardinal, his father from Latvia, Lithuania, who basically survived the Soviet Union, um, Cardinal Mueller from Germany, and there's American uh, bishop from uh, Tyler, Texas, or Strickland, Texas. But what basically they're saying is that we are not denying the reality of the COVID virus. What we are saying is that there have been some governments around the world, and they've not named names, but they're basically pointing the finger at China. They're pointing the finger at some American governors. They're pointing the fingers at some African states and European states who have used the coronavirus to basically augment their powers and basically are exalting the state over the innate rights of the individual, the freedom of worship, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to think what they believe. And this is a path that we need to protest and say no more, we're not going down this road. And the hierarchy, the Vatican has not said anything, and I'm not aware of any Anglican bishops who have uh, said anything on this point in the church of england actually they're they're actually going farther than the government in supporting shutdowns but there's a the the whole sort of michigan protest the wisconsin protests the new york protests uh california protests are being the theologized by uh traditional catholics in the most part uh who are basically saying that uh the state does not have the authority to do what it says it's doing and that it's pursuing an anti-human policy. Um, and I, I happen to believe they're true. Now, in my particular circumstance, we have been told that we may reopen tentatively after Memorial Day. We have to have 25% attendance, no more. Uh, we have to wear masks. We have to do all through these steps. And the vestry and I have been discussing this. Do we even want to take that risk because we have a predominantly elderly congregation? So, but the, at the end of the day, it comes down to our local decision and the decision of the individual whether or not they wish to attend. No one can compel them. And I think the issue here is compulsion. 
that you're compelled not to attend, you're compelled not to work, you're compelled to do something that somebody who is not a scientist, and the science is unsettled as they like, is it's not as Al Gore say the science says, there is no <laughs> science about coronavirus. You ask as many virologists as there are and you'll get as many different answers what's happening and why and what the future is going to bring. But it's interesting that the churches, and I expect this to gather momentum and other religious groups to pick up and run with it. The churches are basically saying that the state, there are limitations in the national, nat natural authority of the state. And that when they conflict with the right, uh, the God given rights of men and women, the rights of men and women take precedence over the right of the state. It's just, it's one of those times in human history that we're going to look back on and we're going to see that there were good actors and there were bad actors. And uh, some people see a huge conspiracy, uh, New World Order uh, happening here. I don't see that, but I do see some people who got that taste of power and they like it. You know, they like being able to to tell people what to do. They like to be able to uh, affect an economy. They like to be able to uh, close the churches and I'll I'll reopen them when I feel like it. Attitude, and I it's it's hard to watch, but we've seen this so many times in the last fifteen thousand years of uh, of Judeo Christian uh, history, where you get a little bit of power and you, you run with it. And hopefully the governments, when this is over, don't run with that power. And there's also sort of, maybe this is more of an American idea, but we have a phenomenon here in the United States of uh, county sheriffs, for instance, in Michigan. That's good, yeah. And in uh, various uh, parts of the Northeast where they have these lockdowns are saying, we're not going to arrest anybody who violates the governor's order. Uh, the governor of Michigan has put out 78 executive orders that have not been ratified by the legislature that uh, there are legal and judicial challenges to her constitutional authority to say you can get an abortion, but you can't get a knee replacement. Uh, in other words, she's gotten to that degree of minu uh, minutiae, and sheriffs are not enforcing these rules. Um, so that there's an American streak of, uh, you're not going to tell me what to do. Well. Uh, one of the geniuses of our constitutional form of government is checks and balances. You know, there's just not a whole lot the executive can do if the other two branches don't want to do it, and, and vice versa. And so we're in this this paradigm shift of watching uh, the constitutional state at work. And I, I don't wish to get into partisan politics, but in Florida, we've seen the Democrats and Republicans work play together well. Miami and Bra Miami, Dade County and Broward County are the heart of the Democratic establishment in Florida. The rest of the state, except for spots here and there, are Republican, and the governor is Republican. He has worked very well, positively, with Miami and Dade County, and I don't know whether it's we're blessed or he's taken the he, they collectively have taken the right steps, but. You know, the coronavirus, I'd say it's not a big thing down here. It's fearful. We're scared. Sure. But we're not New York. We're not New Jersey. We're not Pennsylvania. And they've taken very different, uh, how should I put it, combative stances toward those who disagree. My home state of Wisconsin is at war. The Republican uh, Supreme Court of Wisconsin is at war with the uh, Democrat governor, uh, Democratic governor of Wisconsin, and they're fighting it out. And uh, they overturned his executive order to lock down the state. And 15 minutes later, the bars and taverns are full of people drinking and celebrating that the governor's uh, wicked witch policies are thrown out. And I'm looking at this on TV and I'm thinking natural selection. Well, yeah. it's also it's what it's what happened in the Church of England. The bishops mm -hmm. of the Church of England decided to do a do a Mario Cuomo. That's right. uh, no, Mario's dead. Uh, Andrew yeah, that's Cuomo. Right. Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> do an Andrew Cuomo and <laughs> basically say we're going to micromanage it such that you cannot, you priests, we're going to contradict canon law, which says you must celebrate, it must be present in your churches on Sunday. We're saying you're not allowed to do that. Even though they, you don't have, we don't have the authority to do that, and we're going to micromanage your life and not let you make an adult decision. That's what the governors of New York and Pennsylvania and these other states have done. Yeah. Um, 
give a shout out to uh, uh, the ACNA and the some Episcopal bishops, my bishop here. They've been quite clear as to what they think, but at the end of the day, and they've given you know, we if you do reopen, you need to have twenty. You know, you need to follow guidelines. these guidelines. Sure. Yeah. But the choice to reopen or close mm. under these parameters mm. rests with your clergy and mm. wardens. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's because of my temperament. I find that a much more appealing approach than to have some unelected, unaccountable person telling me what to do. Amen. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 597 of Anglican Unsuspect.